Life Over Coffee, Conversations for Transformation. The best discipleship soul care happens in a community, not isolated artificial settings where there is a disconnection between the person and the community. God can change lives in a one-and-done or a season of meetings, and I don't believe that any reasonable person would argue against the good Lord doing just that. And so I am not saying that a counseling session won't work, a one-and-done session. I'm not saying that three, six, twelve meetings won't work to bring the transformation that a person desires. But the most compelling soul care needs time, it needs people, and it needs context. What I'm talking about here is body-to-body ministry is the primary way that change happens, placing a requirement on me, a requirement on you, on every believer to do all they can to equip themselves to make our local churches more effective discipleship communities. Hello, everybody. This is Rick Thomas. Thank you so much for joining me for Life Over Coffee. Check out our coffee shop. It is a busy place, praise God, and there is so much happening over there. We are creating creating resources every day, at least Monday through Friday. And so there is always something new over there, and there's always dynamic communi- uh, dynamic conversations going on in our communities. Of course, if you want to be part of those communities, uh, that is a supporting membership, and I would encourage you to do that. I have just been reading some of the conversations that have been going on in our forums today. I'm talking about serious-minded disciple-makers, Christians that want to mature in this idea of discipleship. And if you're that kind of person, maybe uh, becoming part of our member community would be perfect for you. Nevertheless, what I want to do here is I want to talk about a distinction between fighting fires and changing lives. I think most of us fight fires, meaning that we just meet with people and we're trying to put it out. But because we don't have a fuller context or because we're not interacting with everybody that's a part of the problem, that we just aren't, we don't have the context or the tools uh, to be able to work in a most comprehensive way. And so we end up talking to one person about a problem, like say a relationship issue, and we can't talk to both people. We meet them in accountability meetings, but outside the milieu of where they actually live. And so we never get a full uh, perspective on their lives because we're not in their, in their lives. And actually, that's one of the things that's one of many things that's wrong with biblical counseling is that it's an artificial context for transformation to happen. Now, again, all of those secondary tier ways of helping people change, they are not wrong. But again, I want to make a a strong case here that there is a difference between firefighting, meeting people in isolated contexts for a limited amount of time and just trying to put out a fire, versus having a context, a methodology, a community that we all are immersed in to where transformation has the best shot of happening. Let me illustrate my point here by sharing a story of something that happened to me a number of years ago. A man called me, a friend of mine, by the way, and he asked if I would mentor him. He asked if I would meet with him once or twice a month for discipleship purposes. I appreciate his heart. I appreciate his humility. I appreciate his desire to want to change. I appreciate the confidence that he placed in me to come alongside him to help him to mature in Christ. I understood his question. But what I was struggling with was how to tell him that what he was asking would not deliver what he wanted. The only discipleship model that he knew was the one-to-one model that has become prevalent in the church over the past few decades. It's an insufficient model, though it adapts well to our fast-paced lifestyles and our busy calendars. Adaptability is its most significant feature because you can wrap that meeting around uh, any particular space that you have in your calendar. If you are busy and you do not have the time to dig into the muck of a person's life in the context of community, then the every so often one-to-one routine is a quick and safe option for you. But that is ineffective. Ineffectiveness is its greatest weakness. I call it doing Denny's, named after the restaurant chain. 
not because of any affiliation or affection for the restaurant chain, but because it just rolls off the tongue. We are doing Denny's. We're going to meet once a week, every two weeks, once a month, doing Denny's, meeting in the restaurant, and just talking about whatever's going on in his life, providing him the accountability and the mentoring. Actually, it was the mentoring that he was wanting. And so the question is not whether meeting with someone in any context is helpful, because absolutely it can be. You can meet with anyone, and God can do a fantastic thing in that meeting. That's not what I'm talking about. The real issue is whether meeting with someone outside of that person's regular life setting is the best option to help him transform into Christ's likeness. Now think about that sentence. Is it best to meet with someone outside of his real life in which he functions, outside of his local church, outside of his home, outside of his wife, outside of his children, outside of other things that he does, that we pull aside every two weeks or once a month to do Denny's? Is that the best option? Well, of course it's not. These abbreviated and artificial meetings have a limited effect, but not a full effect. And that is the difference. The early church's discipleship model was relational. It was holistic. It was communal. And it was in the milieu. In fact, here is a short soundbite from Acts chapter 2, a passage you know. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day attended the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. We must consider several things regarding best practices for transformation. For example, like the doctrine of total depravity. You see, people who only practice one-to-one -one soul care outside of real-life context I think they need to reflect more on the overall effects of sin in their lives. The Bible teaches the total depravity of the human race. Total depravity means radical corruption. And of course, we're going to note the difference between total depravity and utter depravity. To be utterly depraved is to be as wicked as one could be. And nobody has ascended to that height or descended to that depth. I mean, even... Hitler was extremely degenerate, but he could have been worse than he was. He was totally depraved, but not utterly depraved. There are deeper depths that he could descend into. I'm a sinner, but I could sin more. I could sin more often. I could sin more severely than I do. I am not utterly depraved, but I am totally depraved. The late R.C. Sproul said it this way, for total depravity means that I and everyone else are depraved or corrupt in the totality of our being. There is no part of us that is left untouched by sin. Our minds, our wills, and our bodies are affected by evil. We speak sinful words, do sinful deeds, have impure thoughts. Our very bodies suffer from the ravages of sin. Now, I would appeal to you to carefully think through what R.C. Sproul said. We are not only worse off than we ever imagined, but we are capable of doing things that are more wicked than anything we have done up to this moment. If the only context in which you are meeting with a person is one-to-one -one, in an environment outside of your everyday community, then you will limit your ability to know and, and impact that person or to be known and to be impacted by someone mentoring you. And this lack of complete relational care will make you frustrated, especially if you are the mentor, the disciple, or, and they do not change. A lack of long-term effectual change is one of the biggest reasons that I do not prefer counseling as a standalone event disconnected from a community of believers who can provide ongoing reciprocal care. The overwhelming majority of the people who change do so because they were involved in more than a counseling event or more than a counseling season. 
statistically, as far as my counseling is concerned, is that people experience transformation after the counseling season. Now, part of that is because God grants repentance, and it's not a guarantee that God will grant repentance during a counseling event or a counseling season. Therefore, you want a person to be in a stream of sanctification in an unending way as you work with them and as you pray that God would grant repentance in their life. The doctrine of human depravity demands more than a counseling event or a counseling season for actual life change. When you meet a person and you ask, how are they doing? They're going to say that, I am doing fine. I am doing good. I am doing okay. As one of my friends says, the word fine is an acronym. It means feelings inside never expressed. And he's right. When I meet someone and they say that they're doing fine, I automatically know there is a second question. Great. Feelings inside never expressed. Now, second question. Tell me how you are really doing. We will always and forever put our best foot forward when asked how we are doing. And there's several reasons for this, some of which are good, though there's a deeper problem. We may say we are fine because it's a quick and easy way, but we are never actually fine. Not according to R.C. Sproul, which I 100% agree with. And to compound this problem, we are never fully aware of how unfine we are. None of us have enough self-awareness to inform ourselves how to be self-suspicious. Remember total depravity? The word total actually means total. We are totally depraved. Our thinking is not entirely in line with the gospel. And it never will be until we meet Jesus when we receive our, our body upgrade. And think about these few verses that talk about the total depravity of humanity or it implies the need that, that we need each other because we can't have a pure self-awareness of, of how we are really doing. Proverbs 16.2 says, All the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the Spirit. Proverbs 30, verse number 12. There are those who are clean in their own eyes but are not free from their filth. And then, of course, Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Even on our best days, when we are operating at optimal levels, now I haven't seen that day in my life, but I've heard of people who have actually achieved optimal levels on, on some days. But even then, we do not know ourselves the way we need to be understood. We have Adamic blinders that guarantee blind spots. And personal blindness makes discipling someone outside of their day-to-day -day community an insufficient way of doing sanctification because they will never be able to give you all the information you need to help them. I mean, if I have a lack of self-awareness and if I meet you in a isolated artificial context like doing Denny's, I cannot give you the complete perspective that you need on my life in order for you to help me. And if I am counseling a spouse and the other spouse is not present, I automatically know there is another story that I will never be able to perceive until I talk with the person who is not present. You see, I knew that when my friend and what he was asking was good, but in order to pull off what he was asking, I knew that I could not do it and I needed to figure out a way to not only tell him that, but give him a better option to receive the very thing that he wants. In Proverbs 18, 17, it says, The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. And so if the other person never comes, like for my friend, I never interacted with his wife or his family, or even his local church because I was not part of his local church, then I will only hear his case stated all the time, or his interpretation of his wife's perspective on him, etc. For me, it is the worst possible counseling scenario. These deficiencies in soul care, that is what I wanted to communicate to my friend. I tried to care for him, but I, I wanted him to be in a sanctification community where people knew him daily. Caring for him at Denny's on an every other week basis, yes. It's better than nothing, but it is not as good as seeing him at his local church, in his home, with his wife, with his family, 
and in many other contexts that real community offers. In 1 Corinthians 3, 6, it says, I, Paul, planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Christians are acutely aware that if a person changes, God gives the growth. Our job is to water and plant. God's grace enables and it empowers the transformation. We are planters and waterers. Only the Lord can bring change. And so the question for us is not about who does the changing. The question is, how will we cooperate with the changer of lives in the transformation process? His name is Jehovah. Thus, each discipler must decide on the kind of soul care they want to provide. That's what I was doing with my friend. Here's what you're asking. Here are the hurdles to get to what you want. And so I had to determine the kind of soul care that I wanted to provide for him. There is no one way or there's no correct answer for discipleship. And so I'm not narrowing things or limiting things so much that there is only one way that you can discipleship in a community. But there is there is best ways. There are many options. I mean, Jesus used several options as far as his soul care, but they had differing results. But what he would do is he would determine the care that's needed by the person that he was interacting with and the type of need in their lives. Let me illustrate this with several passages of Scripture. In John chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, Jesus did not provide soul care for some people. Now, those were the Pharisees in John 2. In Matthew 23, 37, he did provide soul care if those who needed it would turn from their wicked ways. And so it was conditional. If you will do this, I will meet with you. And again, again in John 2, he would not meet with them at all. In Luke 18, he offered advice, but he did not extend himself beyond that point. There's three different scenarios right there. And so we have to discern each context and determine what is best for the situation, which is what I was doing with my friend. In Matthew 12, Jesus did not provide care to his family if they were not going to do the Lord's will. You remember what he said, who is my mother, who are my brothers? It's those who do the will of God. And then he reached out to the community through others, but did not personally interact with them, as we see in Matthew 14. And then in Matthew 14, again, a little later on, he provided instruction to the community, but found it wiser to get away from them. And so he gave them teaching in a monologue format, but then he withdrew from them, and that is all they received from him. And then there is Matthew 4. This would be the final illustration. He spent most of his time with individuals that he could actually replicate into leaders. Jesus was very discretionary when he looked at each context, recognizing that he was not, there is no equality here. And so when a friend comes to you and they're asking for your care, you have to determine. You have to use wisdom, discernment, and you have to have courage to communicate the right thing based on the situation and what is being asked of you. Jesus implemented a whosoever will method for discipleship, meaning he did not withhold his care from anyone. But everyone did not receive the same kind of attention from him, as you see in those illustrations that I gave you. Providing the same in-depth equipping to every person who knocks on your door is impossible. You see, I didn't want to be frustrated with my friend, and I did not want to frustrate him, but I knew automatically what he was asking. I knew instinctively, and I, and I also knew from experience that what he was asking was impossible. So I gave him an answer that was different from what he was asking me. Different levels of soul care are one of the many things that I appreciate about Jesus. He was discerning and he was courageous enough to know who would get his best discipleship time. He was unafraid to say hard things to people, even if it made them mad. As you see in John eleven twenty one, 21, as he made Mary and Martha mad, or even if they left him without any kind of life change, as you see in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 27. Everybody can receive your care. Everybody can receive your instruction. Everybody can receive your advice. But not everyone can receive your ongoing attention. And I could not give my friend ongoing attention. If you cannot discern the difference 
and divide people accordingly. The request for help will overrun you. And areas of your personal life will begin to unravel because you're saying yes to every request without discernment or courage. Because my friend did not attend my church, it was unwise for me to set up ongoing and unending meetings in artificial context when he could receive better soul care from those who did life with him at his local church. Oh, I could give him some tips. I could point him in the right direction. I could envision him about getting long-term discipleship care in the community context. But I could not provide adequate, comprehensive care because we did not do life together. I would have to set up endless meetings with him, which would sacrifice what I should be doing in my local church. But even more importantly, it could end up sacrificing what I should be doing with my wife and our children. Now, I have an infographic inside of this article, and if you want to read what I'm sharing with you, the title of it is, Do You Fight Fires or Change Lives? If you just type fight fires in the search box of our website, this article will come up and you can read it, watch it, listen to it. But you can also access this graphic. I'm going to describe it to you here, but I want you to have the graphic. Our infographics are free to you along with a thousand other resources, and so I do want you to take advantage of it. So the, this, the infographic, it has, uh, there, there's, two, there's two halves to it. There's two discipleship models that I'm describing in the infographic. And these are the two most common ways that soul care happens in the church today. And so on the right side of this graphic, what I have are two circles. Uh, it's, it's two circles, one stacked on top of the other, and they meet right there at one point. So they, those two circles touch each other right in the middle. Now, the top circle is a person who's living his life out in his own world, as my friend was. And then the bottom circle is me living a totally different kind of life in a different kind of community than my friend. And then we would come together and touch point every two weeks. Every two weeks we'd circle around and touch or once a month or whatever that, whatever that beat is. Now, that is one type of, of meetings that people have prearranged meetings between two people who do not do life together on a daily, weekly basis. And that's the big idea. These kinds of meetings are more artificial than real. Uh, let me... Let's say, let's call them Mabel and Marge, for example, just to give you an illustration. Here's Mabel and Marge that meet every two weeks at a local coffee shop, or maybe they're doing Denny's for about 90 minutes. This is also what a biblical counseling session is, too. And so Mabel is discipling Marge, who is in a difficult marriage, and her teenage children are apathetic toward the church. Mabel doesn't interact with Marge at any other time, just this contact point every two weeks. Marge's husband has anger issues and Marge bounces from fear to bitterness depending on the week, depending on the situation. All Mabel can do is fight fires and that's why I titled this, Do You Fight Fires or Do You Change Lives? You see, Mabel has no leverage over the whole family. Mabel has no insight into the fundamental dynamics of what is going on in the home. She doesn't see how Marge blows up at her wit's end or how her husband checks out because of, of Marge's double-mindedness. You see, but Marge is a victim sinner and so is her husband. Mabel is not a fly on the wall. Uh, we have counseling math. What you see in the counseling office when uh, someone is angry, for example, you multiply that by 10 because they're on their best behavior in a counseling office. But if you see anger or bitterness or disgruntledness or grumbling or complaining, you just multiply that by 10. That's counseling math because it's far worse in their context where they are more comfortable but where you will never see them because you're a firefighter. You're not a person with a community where changed lives can actually happen. And so Marge will talk about getting frustrated, but that's, as far, that's a far cry from reality. Seeing is believing, but Mabel cannot see. She can only take Marge's perspective because they are doing Denny's. At best, Mabel can give advice and she can send Marge on her way, hoping a nugget of truth dropped will slow down the dysfunctional spin of the home. 
The problem with this model is that their primary interaction is in a context that does not resemble how they live at all. Artificial settings describe counseling sessions. Counseling is another doing Denny's model of discipleship. The artificial context model leaves you guessing, speculating, drawing conclusions, assuming, and hoping you understand because you are never the proverbial fly on the wall of their lives. Now, in this infographic, there is another model that's on the left side of the graphic. Th this model gives you wall space <laughs> to hang out with those that you're discipling. You are the fly on the wall. You're not doing Denny's. You're doing life together with another person, with another couple, with another family, with another small group. You are in there. You are immersed. This second is a more extensive circle. It's, it's actually one circle because you're all doing life together. Historically, it's how I have led small groups. In the doing life together model, and what you will see if you get this inf infographic, you'll see at least 13 different contexts in which you can connect with someone, the corporate meeting, the small group meeting, couple to couple meetings, Man to man, woman to woman, babysitting, going on vacations, cooking out together, talking on the phone, emailing with each other. They ain't no biblical counselor in the world that will do all of that. But all of that can happen when you're doing life together and you don't have the doing Denny's model. Now, of course, you will not do all of those things with every member of your small group. But you potentially could do any of those things. And if you're doing small group life well, then you'll be doing most of them. And those that you're developing will be modeling your leadership. And so now it will be a collective effort of people doing all of those things as you multiply yourself throughout your, your friend list. You cannot do this kind of life with every person you meet. Not even Jesus could sustain this level of discipleship with everyone. He had a small group of 12 people. They received his most comprehensive care. Nobody was left behind if they did not want to be left behind. But everybody did not get prime time with Christ. Discipleship is a two-way street. It is not a unidirectional model where you're doing Denny's and mentoring every two weeks. Reciprocal soul care is the primary reason for doing life together. We need someone caring for our souls too. I do not want to meet at Denny's with someone uh, to care for me if they're not caring for my wife and not caring for my children simultaneously. There is no way for them to know me if they do not know my wife and do not know our children. If you want to know me, spend time with my wife and spend time with our children. Spend time with me. My family will give you a more accurate description of the kind of person I am when you're meeting with me alone. And when I say that I'm fine and you are immersed in my life and we're doing life together, you will know better. You will be the proverbial fly on the wall. Not only will they help you to help me, but you will find out quickly what kind of husband and a father I am. They are exhibit A to the leadership and care that I provide in our home. Please don't ask the farmer at Denny's to describe his garden to you, the fruit of his hands. No, walk into his fields and examine them for yourself. It will not take you long to get an accurate bead on the kind of person that you are discipling. But my friend came to me and he said, I want you to uh, mentor me. I appreciate that. I really do. But it was a self-limiting ask. And I knew that. And I love my friend. I wanted him to have better. Now, that was many years ago. My friend went on and received that discipleship care at his local church. He went on to be a pastor and an elder at that local church. He and his wife and family are doing very well today. But it's not because I was meeting with him. He received the care in a fuller context that was more comprehensive and praise God, that's what he needed, and a lot of transformation happened. I've titled this, Do You Fight Fires or Change Lives? Let me ask you a couple of questions. I have three questions here, and then we'll wrap up. Number one, are you a firefighter or a soul care provider? Now, one of the things that you're going to have to think about, if you're a firefighter, 
you have to be very careful because you, you could set yourself up for being. The world calls it burned out, but that's really not an accurate descriptor. That's a euphemism that means uh, you're angry, you're bitter, you're cynical, you're frustrated, you're impatient, you are physically exhausted or keep adding ad infinitum. Firefighters become exhausted that way. If you are a soul care provider, then it is a body-to-body -body ministry that you are participating in and you're not doing all the heavy lifting. Are you a firefighter or a soul care provider? Number two, why is meeting with someone sporadically in an artificial, in artificial context not a good discipleship model? It's not totally bad, as I've said, but it's not the best. And I would love for you to be able to explain why it's not the best. And then finally, number three, what are the advantages of meeting someone in multiple settings? I hope you can answer these last two questions. Why is one-to-one, -one isolated, doing Denny's insufficient? And why, is, why are there advantages in meeting someone in multiple contexts where you're interacting with the spouse, the children, the friends, their hobbies, and you're also in their milieu. You're not in a artificial counseling office. It's far superior. I'm sure you can answer the question. I'm sure that you know why. Part of what I'm sharing here, this particular article, Do You Fight Fires or Change Lives? It's in a book that I have written called Local Church. I want you to get it. There are 16 chapters there. This is one of them. It's a free download in our store. Please go and get it and let your friends know. This could be a, just a radically transforming book for an individual, for a small group, for a local church. And so I want you to get it. I want you to have it. It is my gift to you. Thank you so much and God bless. Thanks for joining us. Learn more and get access to other resources at lifeovercoffee.com.